Well, hello, Bluegrass fans, and welcome to Bluegrass Online from Leadership Bluegrass. This is Navigating the Digital Jungle. My name is Jeff West and I am a proud member of the class of 2015 Leadership Bluegrass, and I am now the Leadership Bluegrass Program Facilitator. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Leadership Bluegrass Program. It is the International Bluegrass Music Association's annual intensive professional development program building leaders across all areas of bluegrass music. In place of an in-person program this year, of course, we are sharing a taste of the leadership bluegrass with the entire community through a webinar series taking place every Thursday through March. Each week will also feature a set from a chosen international bluegrass band. And the, the band last time was quite good. It was a Korean bluegrass band and I quite enjoyed it. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the one that we're gonna have today in a few minutes. In the meantime, though, I'd like you to support the Leadership Bluegrass and other IBMA programs by donating or becoming an IBMA member today. You can visit IBMA.org for more information. Now, today's uh, session is particularly special, and I would like to make welcome today's presenter, Bart Herbison. Bart is the Executive Director of the Nashville Songwriters Association International, that's the NSAI. It's the world's largest not-for-profit songwriters trade association and advocacy group. It's dedicated to the songwriting profession with more than 100 chapters. The association serves thousands of aspiring and professional songwriters in all genres of music. And joining Bart today will be Jennifer Turnbow, who is the COO of the NSAI. And both Jennifer and Bart have encouraged me to encourage you to keep having questions come yeah. forward because uh, they were they're very uh, very way, good way of interacting with 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 Bart and, and he would prefer to have a lot of questions so type them go ahead and type them in the chat room and uh, and Bart will get those questions and answer them later in the presentation uh, more about Bart under his leadership NSAI gained prominence in the national legislative arena including the adoption of the Music Modernization Act, MMA. By the way, uh, I looked up MMA on the web. It turns out that it also stands for Mixed Martial Arts. Mixed Martial Arts, arts yeah. We, so see Ronda, we doing don't see me, we see, that. we see Ronda Rousey. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in uh, 2018, and the creation of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, passaging of, passage of the Songwriters Capital Gains Tax Equity Act in 2006, and much, much more. So Bart has an extensive uh, uh, background in, in legislation associated with songwriting and music industry and things of that nature. In addition to his work with NSAI, he currently serves on the board of directors of the Mechanical Licensing Collective and hosts weekly interview series, The Story Behind the Song. Please make welcome Bart Herbison. Thank you, Jeff. And Thanks to the leadership program and IBMA. I just want to ask one favor. We get to come do this in person next year because we've been a while, right, Jennifer? About a year since we did anything like that. It's been exactly a year, I think. Yeah. So we've got a lot we're going to cover. We're going to cover it in a short amount of time. Your head's going to swim with details because I think you get one of our big challenges is explaining a million complicated things to a member of Congress in three minutes. But we're going to slow down on some of the important parts, especially the part you need to pay attention to that may get you some money you're not collecting right now. So, Jen, I'm going to give a little history lesson to start with, and I'm going to super abbreviate it. And, and I don't want, you know, a bunch of criticism. You left this detail out or you took a little license because I'm going to leave some details out and take a little license. But the whole story starts in 1909. Edison is recorded sound and the U.S. Congress realizes they've got to get a modern copyright law. They had a piecemeal English version literally from the 1600s and so we modernized copyright law. A couple things were put into law then. The record labels, the Edaphone Company and, and the others few that existed then were essentially put under no government regulations. They set their own prices, they set their own rules as they should have because the marketplace can best determine those things. But that didn't happen to songwriters. They were put under essentially four rules that were disastrous then. The Music Modernization Act changed some of those rules, but they remain ridiculous today. 
The first is the government would set our royalty rates. <laughs> How's that going to work? It's, it hasn't very well. Number two, under a ridiculous standard of evidence. So one of the big things we're going to talk about today is mechanical royalties. And I think most of you songwriters know you get a performance royalty from your performing rights society and you get a mechanical royalty. And we'll get into more of that later because that's one of the centerpieces of the Music Modernization Act. <clears throat> but the law said you can only pay that songwriter a mechanical royalty so low that the customer buying a mechanical player piano law or a piece of sheet music won't notice a price increase. We don't even know what that means today. But what it meant back then is they got a penny. And some of these new wax cylinders were four, five, six bucks at the time. Songwriters got a penny for each song split among all the songwriters and all the publishers. So typically they got a quarter of a cent. And they didn't get a pay raise on that until 1978 when that mechanical royalty and again, this is all on physical products at the time, was two cents. The third bad thing, it's a compulsory license. So Jeff wrote a great song. He's got it out there, but he doesn't think that rate's fair. Too bad, Jeff. You have to license it for that government set rate. And that's kind of what happened to us. And um, a similar thing happened when the United States government in 1941 put ASCAP and BMI under consent decrees. And they said, basically, here's how you're going to set your performance royalties. And here's the rules under which you pay them. The standard of evidence was a little different, but it was equally ridiculous. What we wanted from the start is to negotiate this in the marketplace. We still don't have that, but it's been vastly improved. So we're not getting paid enough. The digital era comes along, streaming happens, record labels are negotiating rates, and songwriters are not. We're waiting on performance royalty rate courts, we're waiting on the Copyright Royalty Board to set these rates. So about 12 years ago, the disparity was 1,700%. The record side made 17 times what the song made, and that was ridiculous. The marketplace has set a value on that. It's 50-50. The only place songwriters get to negotiate is on synchronization. When you put one of your songs in, a, in video, a company years ago, years ago, long before I was there, really when this association started 54 years ago, and even before that, songwriters had tried to change these rules. And Jennifer, we made the bold, most bold changes, the Music Modernization Act. We'll get into the specifics of the bill Man, it was a low though. It was busy. It was crazy. I wasn't sure we were going to get there. But in this divided, polarized, whatever political party you are, we're a political party, by the way. We belong to the songwriter party. And so whatever side you are on, we go through the most cantankerous two committees on Capitol Hill, the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee. You know, it wore me out. You look better for it. But a little bit, just a little bit about the process and how it was to get an agreement first of all, among everybody in the industry, and then then that. Yeah, I mean, the Music Modernization Act technically was 20 odd years in the making. I mean, we it goes all the way back to legislation that had been introduced and talked about 20 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, but then a few years before the Music Modernization Act, we had a bill in Congress that really just sought to, the Songwriter Equity Act, the SEA, we called it, um, that sought to change these ways that we set rates, change these rate standards that Bart was talking about earlier. Um, and, you know, that we felt like that would really help us to raise both performance and mechanical rates. But we had the problem at the time that obviously the digital services didn't want to pay higher rates. And so ultimately that bill then got made a part of this larger Music Modernization Act that included creating the MLC, 
the Mechanical Licensing Collective to allow the digital services to take a blanket digital mechanical license, which was something that they really wanted to do to avoid the lawsuits that they were dealing mm-hmm. with at the time. Um, and so it, you know, it was a it was a beautiful moment in time where the digital services needed something, and we had wanted better rates for a long time, and so we were able to come to an agreement on that, and then spent the better part of two Congresses getting support for it and getting it through, but ultimately passed it with a hundred percent support. We had Unbelievable no, still. no no votes. So just to put that down on the street level. You got a performance royalty that the PROs manage and and, and deal with. You got a mechanical royalty. You've got the song under a completely different copyright than the record somebody makes of the song. And I have to tell you, one of the reasons we only make major improvements in copyrights about every 30 or 40 years is because everybody's worried that if we, if we, increase it over here, it's going to take part of the pie away over there. So it was it was remarkable. And one of the ways we did that, you know, there's a lot of artists watching this. They still don't get a royalty from broadcast radio. They should, but that wasn't going to pass. That would have killed the whole Music Modernization Act because there just wasn't enough support on it. And we were in a time and still are where one senator, one can stop the entire bill so if you want to know what a big deal this was to make this unanimous, what about an hour before we were still wondering if it was going to pass because we're making deals all the way up to it and trying to, trying to you know, take care of a lot of myriad interest. So let's jump into it. About five years before that bill passed, NSAI went to Capitol Hill and along with the National Music Publishers Association, we did an event. There were four songwriters that appeared in a big room right before the Judiciary Committee had a hearing on this issue. And you may not know the songwriters. There was Desmond Child. I don't know if you know Desmond, but you know Living on a Prayer for John Bon Jovi. Cara Diaguardi, B.C. Jean, Linda Perry, who was amazing, did Christine Aguilera's song Beautiful that she wrote for. And our own president at the time, Lee Miller, you're going to miss this. They each played their song. Here was our entire event. We don't say anything. We introduce the writers, they play the song. And one giant screen comes up above their heads. It said, each of these writers have a 25% ownership of that song, co-writer, publisher. For 35 million streams, they each made $185. And I don't think we ever did anything that got Congress's attention more than that. I really believe that was the day that we started really rolling toward what President Trump finally signed in October of 2018. But there was also some people with political courage. Bob Goodlatte was chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Under his chairmanship, he was willing to take on copyrights, which really politically for most members of Congress is a lose-lose. There's not a music industry in most districts. People won't want to pay more for music. But we start with Bob Goodlatte's political courage and Orrin Hatch's political courage in the Senate. But on the House side, two members in particular, and the the chief person to be credited was Doug Collins, a relatively new member of Congress from Georgia that grew up, love songs, love songwriters, and Hakeem Jeffries. So you've got two really polar political opposites that work together to get this done. In the Senate, you had Sheldon Whitehouse working with Senator Hatch, and I have to give a lot of credit to Tennessee Senator Lamar Alexander. So we did it, we passed it. Now let's break down what we did. On your performance royalties, Jennifer, Mm -hmm. we got a new rate standard. Now, I don't think ASCAP and BMI had a trial yet. What does that mean? What does that even mean? What is the wheel? What is this thing? Now, this is your performance royalties, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR. Yeah, so when ASCAP or BMI need to set a rate with a service, you know, a a term is up or a new service comes into existence, they go to what we call a rate court, which sounds like this big conglomerate thing. It's really one court in the Southern District of New York, one judge, 
Um, and same then, judge every time, right? And it, at, the, at the time, it was the same judge every time. ASCAP had a judge, BMI had a judge, and you went to the same person. And you made your case, you know, ASCAP wants X amount per spin because of this reason. Service wants to pay a lot less than that. And that judge would then make a determination, set a rate, and you went forward. That didn't work out very well because we we weren't the judge. At least one of the judges was not incredibly friendly to us. Um, and so the MMA did a couple of things there. One was that they instituted a wheel, which works. It works this way in a, in a lot of courts where you don't have the same judge every time. When you go to court a quote unquote wheel gets spun and you could get any of a number of judges within that district. Which is fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really, it makes it, it definitely makes it more fair that way. The other thing is that it changed the rate standard. So prior to the MMA, the PROs were completely disallowed from bringing any record label based money into the testimony at all. So they couldn't say that, you know, the record label was getting 17 times more on performance than they were. That, that just wasn't allowed in testimony. So this took that out. This now allows them to bring that in as evidence, which is, it, it's really helpful evidence when we're talking about how much the song is worth. It's bound to result in songwriters getting paid more now. We haven't had a rate court yet. This all became, you know, um, law recently. So we're waiting to see. And look, you can settle, but if you don't settle, and often you don't settle with the PRO, you go to rate court. So random judges, more fair. And not only can you bring in what the marketplace does, it's now required. Mm -hmm. So we're about to get into the most important part for most of the audience today of the Music Modernization Act. If I'm Spotify or if I'm Amazon or I'm Apple, how do I get licenses for performance royalties? For performance royalties. For perfor right? Oh, for performance royalties. From ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Go to the four PROs. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, and you get a blanket license. It's pretty simple. As long as you license with all four of them, you're covered. I send you a quarterly payment and you pay the songwriters. I don't worry about that. Right. Now, what do I get under a blanket license if I'm a streaming service? Indemnity? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't really do anything wrong as long as you get all the licenses and you pay appropriately. You've licensed all of the music. You can't be sued for copyright infringement. But you could on the mechanical royalty side. Right. Now, <clears throat> do you remember August of 2017 being at a big table in Washington, D.C.? And the digital services said, <laughs> we're going to do a lacting here, so watch us. <laughs> Look, and I, I value this moment. Chris Harrison, that was the director of the Digital Media Association, said almost verbatim, what if we did a blanket license for mechanicals? Jennifer and I are so happy because it's something we'd wanted for years. We knew that in exchange for that, we were probably going to get a lot of things. And so our colleague, David Israelites over here, I looked at Jennifer trying not to smile. I think it was by my lip. We looked at David and I really knew that there was the possibility, if not the likelihood, we would finally pass something after all these years. So we make an agreement. We agree not to sue the streaming companies for mechanical royalties if they'll agree to change the way those royalties are set, number one. And in order to do that, we've got to create a new agency that's sort of similar to ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or GMR, but for mechanicals. And that was going to be pretty expensive, right, Jennifer? Absolutely. I think the first year and a half or the first two years, it's 60 some odd million dollars. Mm -hmm. So we said, will you pay for it? Yes. Will you do certain things? And even while you're streaming, if you don't know the owner of the song, will you accrue the money for them so we can go find them, blah, 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 blah. The next thing you know, the Music Modernization Act passes a year later. Yeah. 
So now we're under a new blanket system for mechanical rugs. What's the next step? Who gets to be that agency, Jennifer? Right. So the law left it up to the Copyright Office to allow agencies to apply to be the Mechanical Licensing Collective. Um, two groups did apply. Um, the group that we, NSAI, and the National Music Publishers Association um, sort of spearheaded was ultimately chosen by the Copyright Office. Um, and that has now become what you know now as the Mechanical Licensing Collective. Um, and then once chosen by the Copyright Office, there was, there was a lot to do. I mean, there was zero infrastructure. There was, there was no data there. We didn't have a board. We didn't have anything at the time. <laughs> no. So, you know, we've spent since then doing all of that, getting a, you know, creating bylaws, creating different partnerships to obtain data and create a database and build a website that's functional for copyright owners to use. Um, and so that that has been quite the undertaking. It, it went live January 1st of this year. We'll send out our first payments in April. Everybody pay attention. Pay attention to me. The next couple minutes of why you really need to be part of this today. And by the way, we still don't have any questions. I don't know if we need to grab some off Facebook and put them in here or whatever, but we'd love some questions. It's free. Now, to collect your performance royalties, all you got to do is join ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or GMR, and you're done. Mm -hmm. Make sure they've got your songs reported and you're off to the races. Not so with mechanicals. You had to collect them. Mm -hmm. You had to go to every different streaming service and register and put your data in there. And it was a chore. It's or you a had to chore. Use a service like a Harry Fox that you paid right. for. Or you hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, our bluegrass friends, by and large, make money playing their music live. You can sell some records. We're not talking. The MLC doesn't deal with the record. It deals with the underlying song. So have you got any streaming activity? The MLC does not collect physical product mechanicals for a number of reasons. That just wasn't part of the equation. So if you're selling CDs or somebody's selling them for you, we don't do that. We also don't collect for streaming activity outside the United States. That's a whole different set of questions, but think of it this way. If the subscriber is located in the US or a territory and that you're paying your bill to Spotify or Amazon from a US address, that's what we deal with. We deal with that money, that activity, and we deal with legal downloads. Now, are you due any mechanical royalties in streaming? I don't know. But all you got to do to find out is put your data in and join the MLC. You may be surprised, and we don't know. We don't really know how all this is going to pan out. But if you've got any appreciable, if you're getting a few thousand spends on a streaming service, go today before we start doing payments. What's the website? How would they do this, Jennifer? Go to themlc.com. And become a member. It's free to become a member. You just sign up, give them information. You're going to want info like what your IPI number is, things like that, that you you can get from your PRO stuff too. Um, and see what data is in there and then update and add data as you have it. You know, yeah. make sure all your songs are there. I'll nuance that a little bit. If you have a publisher or something, Jennifer's saying, go sure, make sure they got it in there right. If you don't and you do all this yourself, go join, put it in there. We say connect to collect. <laughs> and that's the truth. Yeah. You may not make a lot. Maybe you'll make something. But the cool part is put it in there once, add to it, and you're off to the races. 
And especially if somebody recuts one of your songs, which is happening more and more for great bluegrass songs right now, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I don't see any questions. I'm wondering if I'm looking at the right chat place here or uh, here we go, from Ricky. I have a song re on a recurring streaming program and my song is published via a PRO then I don't need to do any other paperwork to receive my royalty. I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but like, let's take a pass at it. If you've got a song as a theme song on a program, you know, I don't know if that's what we're talking about. We're talking about streaming subscription services, Spotify, Apple, Pandora, Google, Amazon. I thought there were that, maybe a few more. We found out there are more than 100 in the United States now, Jennifer. And there is a list of those, I think, available somewhere, if not on the MLC website that's been published. So all you've got to do is join your PRO and the MLC if you're the songwriter. Mm -hmm. If you're also the artist, join Sound Exchange, because that's your performance royalties from the record side. If song, great question. If songs are registered in HFA, will they still be uploaded to the MLC? They already have been. You want to explain about them as our vendor, Jennifer? Absolutely, yeah. So like I was saying, the MLC started with nothing. And so in order to get data to start with, it needed to contract with a vendor. We had two years. We couldn't have collected data on 17 million songs in two years. And so ultimately the MLC chose to enter into a contract with HFA to obtain that data. Um, and so anything that is was in HFA prior to the MLC or since then has been transferred to the MLC database. And we own it. That was important when we chose Harry Fox. Didn't matter who the vendor was going to be. We got a little brush back, but I was part of the group that made that choice and we're glad we made it. Tracy, what I'm wondering is why you haven't already gotten a letter because you should have. You should have gotten a letter when your data was transferred. So what you're gonna have to do, and I'm gonna get in the weeds a little bit here, bear with me. You're gonna go to the MLC and you're gonna see a word, you're just gonna see the portal. It's, it's data on 17 million songs. Some of it's pretty raw data. You can go look in that and see if your stuff is registered and it's in some sort of alphabetical order. Later this year, there's gonna be a more concise portal for songwriters to go to and flag any errors they see in their data. Will the HFA data get uploaded regularly on an ongoing basis? Yes. Um, you have to determine whether you want to do it that way anymore because the MLC does it with no charge. That's a nuanced thing that you need to talk to Harry Fox about. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to also suggest, you know who's going to make sure you get paid? You. Mm -hmm. So you got to go check your data and you can check it in this massive portal with what do we get? It's billion, nine billion lines of code. I think okay. it's a lot. But you can see it, but the, uh, in short order, in a few months, there's going to be a, a more succinct portal where you can go in there and we'll say Tracy's last name is Smith and they've got it as Harry Smith. Well, that's wrong. For, you either change it yourself if you're the administrator of your songs, but if you've got a publisher, you flag it, you click it, it gets reported, it gets reported back to you when it's changed. But look, it's all about data. It's all about data. If your stuff's in there right, you're going to get paid and you're going to be eligible for unclaimed funds when we distribute those. So let's talk, talk about that. The most, hold on. If I play a set of covers on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, no, the MLC does not license Facebook or YouTube. Those are technically our synchronization license because it's your song with video. Here's what we license. Apple. Amazon, Pandora, Spotify, Google, Tidal. We, repre we represent the streaming services for US activity only and any legal downloads. 
So anything you're seeing where your music's attached to video, that's not what we do. That's something you're supposed to negotiate. Now you may get performance royalties from your PRO on that, but for your mechanical, essentially you've got to negotiate that. And if you're playing a set of covers, you don't get anything anyway because you didn't write the song. <laughs> now you may get some performance type stuff. I don't know exactly how they do that. We put out a big press release, Jennifer, recently, $424 million in unclaimed funds. Right. How do I get mine? It's a good question. <laughs> I think it's a question on everybody's mind. So the services have been accumulating this money that they didn't know who to pay. And part of the law was that they had to turn it over to the MLC by a given date. And then by a later date in June, they have to turn over all the data that accompanies it. So right now the MLC has the money sitting in a bank account. Drawing interest, by the way, which you're gonna share in. Yep, getting interest. But they don't have all the data. Hold that on, I want that interest on 424 <laughs> million. No, but the, one of the things we fought for, Jennifer, is we knew, we fought for this in the bill, that when that money came over, that it had to come to us on a day, even before we could send it out, which a lot of it won't go out for three years, but we insisted, you and I and others, on getting that interest to be paid out to the people who deserve it. No, absolutely. So right now they don't have the data that goes with it. That's not due till June. Once the data that goes with it is received by the MLC, they will ingest all of that and the first thing that happens is that they will take that data and compare it to what is in the MLC database. Try to just clean it up. And there will be a portion where they figure out that like, yeah, maybe Pandora didn't know who to pay here, but we have the right data. And so that will just be immediately paid out with normal, regular payment. Your normal monthly. We, the MLC pays monthly. Yes. So some of this unclaimed funds will get paid out appropriately almost immediately. Then a portal will go up at the MLC website that has all of this data listed, that these are the songs and any information that the service had that accompanies those songs that you can look through and go, you know what, that actually belongs to me and isn't something that that I've gotten. And you can quote unquote claim it. So you'll go in and you'll provide some documentation to the MLC that this belongs to you. And another big portion will then be cleaned up with that. Then we, we pay as we find you. Yeah, absolutely. Then after a period of time and the MLC, the, the law prescribes a certain amount of time, but the MLC has has committed to taking the longest period of time that they can. So likely at least three years from now, there's definitely gonna be a certain amount of this that just doesn't get cleaned up. It's, it's just not going to. Nobody's gonna claim it appropriately. It's not gonna match anything in the database. There's never gonna be 100% matching. Now, I hope that we can ultimately get well into the 90s, but we're not going to get to 100. So there is going to be some money that's just there. And we didn't want it to just sit there. I mean, it needs to go somewhere. Well, what formula do I get mine? How, how, what's my share? How's that determined? Yeah. So at some point years from now, the MLC will take this money and they'll look at it and go, okay, this was Spotify money from the first quarter of... 2019. They will then go and look at these are all the people who were paid out from Spotify in the first quarter of 2019. And they will assign them a percentage. So Bart Herbison Publishing received 0.02% of Spotify's first quarter 2019 send outs. Mm. And 
Bard Harvest and Publishing will receive 0.02% of the unclaimed funds from that same period. Okay, I'm a songwriter signed to that publishing company. What's yeah. my take? It go, so it goes to the publisher, but then the publishers are required by law to pay out to the songwriters per contract. So the songwriter will receive at least 50%. If you have CoPub, you might be getting 75 or 80% of it, but it will come through the publisher. Yeah, and an important note there, if you're not even recouped, you still get half of it, whether you're recouped or not. So I'm gonna kind of go back and, and summarize this. The publishing company gets paid from that quarter of Spotify based on how many streams they have. Most stream gets the most unclaimed funds down to the least. What if I don't have a publishing company? Go straight to you. So that's how it works. You know, I hope we can find a lot of this. I think some of it's going to be easy to find. So we're trying to find you or we wait three years. There's some place in the middle. Jennifer mentioned it. Go do this yourselves. Yeah. Go make sure that you don't have any unclaimed money. I'm going to use an illustration. Two of the great songwriters in Nashville, one's on our board, Rivers Rutherford and Tom Shapiro, wrote a Brooks and Dunn song, song called Thinking About You. So we're doing um, one of my story behind the song episodes one day. And before it started, I went, what's the title? I'm talking about the MLC. And I think one of them said, Thinking About You. So it's got a G on it. The other one goes, no, it's thinking, apostrophe, about you. The other one goes, no, if we're going to talk about it, it's thinking apostrophe, apostrophe about you. And so those are the kinds of songs where a comma can mean you don't get paid. Now, you can go look up your data in a lot of places across the world, but I will say that it won't ever be as easy as what we're trying to build here at the MLC. So commas matter, periods matter. Another one, Jennifer, you know, I worked with the guys that wrote God Bless the Broken Road. Where's all of our foreign money? And it was listed as the broken road, the broken road, comma, God bless. Data matters. And so Tracy Smith here, we've got Tracy if we've left the SM off. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to fix. You've got to go fix your data. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions about that. So we're going to change topics for a minute. VMLC.com. Go now. Register if you are the administrator of your songs. If a publisher is the administrator, make sure that they're put in this big portal wide. Mm -hmm. But a little bit later this year, we're going to even have a new system that lets you flag that and it's automatically reported. Mm -hmm. So a couple of big changes if I'm also on the record label side. That was all for songwriters. Let's capsulize this right now before we go forward. If I'm a songwriter, I need to join a PRO and the MLC. Yeah. Now, if I've got physical product, you've got to figure out how to do that yourself. You've got to do it or you've got to hire a company. Right. And I'm good. Mm -hmm. If I'm also the artist, I join Sound Exchange. Perfect. So you got to join. So Jennifer, on the record label side, and, and the Music Modernization Act made mostly more changes for songwriters because our rules were the most antiquated. But, you know, should we recently lost um, Mary from the Supremes. We got to sit with her at an event in D.C. A lot of those records were made before 1972. What was up with that? It was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, so pre-1972 was not a digital performance money was not codified in federal law. And so, so I didn't get paid. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't get paid. Yeah, you might have and you might not have. <laughs> might so not it have. changed in state, several state laws, but it wasn't in federal law. And so there was, there was some inconsistency. There were some services that were following the few state laws that existed and some services that were going strictly by the letter of the federal law. And so there, you weren't necessarily getting paid artist performance money on digital services for pre-1972 co copyrights. So this codified it within federal law. So now, Everybody gets paid 
there are artist performance money through sound exchange on pre-72 copyright. 1971 literally was my second favorite year of music ever. So I'm so glad that happened. Um, one other thing that's important for record labels is they got paid maybe even less than songwriters from satellite radio. Now, yeah. part of an agreement was that's going to change. There's going to be a new rate standard for satellite. I think it's two or three, four more years down it the road. It phases in over time. Yeah. Um, I have to say this. There's also, now I know we're getting into a lot of different topics, but let's go back to 1909 when Congress said the government's going to set your mechanical royalty rate, songwriters, and we got a penny. The way they did that was to construct a panel that is now three federal judges appointed by the Copyright Office that take five years. Every five years, they start a process that looks at those mechanical royalty rates. NSAI and the National Music Publishers Association went to trial against the streaming services 10 to 15 years ago, the first time, because we wanted a piece of the action. We wanted a percent of the revenue they got. And if record labels privately made deals, if they got more, we got more. And I'm glad we did that. History's proved that to be the right choice. But then we didn't go to trial for a little while because under the old rules, believe it or not, there was a chance we were going to get less than $185 for 35 million streams. It got so bad. What has it been now? Six years ago where we, when we started? The last process, five or six years ago, we went to trial. So it was NSAI and NNPA against Apple, Amazon, Pandora, Spotify, and Google. This was under the old rules. Mm -hmm. We want a 44.5% pay raise, the largest in history. Are songwriters getting paid that yet? No, the services filed an appeal. <laughs> Everybody but Apple. Yeah. And we've praised Apple. And look, I, I don't care. Spotify makes it easy for us to criticize them. And I just want to say one thing. Their former head of publishing for the whole United States is a guy named Adam Parness. And I'm calling Adam a whistleblower because you'll look at this week and in, in, is it Worldwide Music News? I think is the name of the publication. It's on our Facebook page. Adam says, you're damn right we could pay songwriters more. So get ready for the next trial. Here's what's crazy. Four of those services appealed it. We've already started the next trial, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I hope we get a verdict on the other one before we go much further down the road with this one. I know. I know. It's, you know, it's, it, we're in a crazy situation where yeah. we, we don't really know <laughs> what happened with our trial from three years ago. And we let's get married. We're not divorced yet. It's kind of like that. I mean, Let's drive the car. We, you know, we haven't built the road. So we've got to find this out. And I'm confident the judges will get a verdict as soon as they can. But they kind of had to start over from scratch. There's one new judge looking at everything again. I feel pretty good about the arguments we've made. I think both sides are confident they're going to win. But it's very difficult to know, A, if we're going to settle with the services or what a trial would look like until we find out what happened last time with them. It is. All right, this may be the most important thing that's not copyright related. Stimulus bill just passed, Jennifer. What does that mean for a lot of our constituents? And let me set this up too. Well, the reason everybody can get unemployment or a paycheck protection loan if you're self-employed is our organization. And sometimes there's still bipartisanship in Washington. We started something 20 years ago called the Songwriters Caucus, which is a philosophically like-minded group of House and Senate members that want to support songwriters. The chairman in the House is Ted Deutsch. He worked Democrat, liberal Democrat, worked with super conservative Republican Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. And back in March, a year, almost exactly a year ago, Jennifer, we wrote and got the language in the CARES Act that made every self-employed person eligible for unemployment because most of them weren't in paycheck protection. So what does that mean with the latest round of stimulus? Yeah, so the latest round of stimulus is expected to be signed by the president tomorrow, so it would be law tomorrow. 
Um, you've probably seen the big headlines of the $1,400 che checks direct to individuals um, that does start to taper down in amount and ultimately cut off um, after you earn $75,000 a year. Um, you know, there's, there's also the child credits of the $300 a month per child. Um, for unemployment, they have extended the federal portion of that. So the self-employed independent contractors remain eligible for unemployment. You file through your state and that you get whatever your state amount is plus $300 per week from federal and that has extended through Labor Day. So you'll continue to get that additional unemployment. Well, we are uh, a month and four days away from income taxes needing to be filed. How does any of this work on my income tax? Yeah, so unemployment uh, is typically taxable, uh, but they've changed it so that the first $10,200 of unemployment throughout the year um, from last year and it, this year are, will, will not be taxable. So you definitely want to be aware of that as you file your taxes, that if you had taxes taken out of unemployment last year, you filed to get that back. Um, stimulus money isn't taxable, so no worries on any of that. That all is just free money. As long as your loan's forgiven, right? You might have to pay some back to the bank if you didn't do it right. But Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the paycheck protection loans, you know, if you if you did that, you take care of all the forgiveness and everything for that with the bank that you right. work with to start with. Um, and as long as it wasn't a huge paycheck protection loan, they've really streamlined the forgiveness program. So if you haven't done that, it's it's not that big of a deal. You have a super insider connection to the most revered songwriter music venue in the world. What am I talking about? So NSAI owns the Bluebird Cafe. Um, and so we we have been closed now for a year as well. Um, and there was some really fabulous legislation in the last stimulus package, the December package, called the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant that allows venues, music venues. Um, it also included like museums and zoos, things like that, to get grants for being closed during most of 2020. Um, Are we frustrated with the Small Business Administration? Let's call them out. Well, it passed, what? Two months ago, we still yeah, haven't seen an application. So. Um, the program's running through the Small Business Administration, and they they well, have get, not started the program. <laughs> get busy. We need you. We, we do. We need them to get that going on. Yeah. Um, new stimulus also um, added in a restaurant portion right. that I'm just now getting really familiar with. Um that will be good for a lot of restaurants as well. Also going through the Small Business Administration, so not sure when anything will come out. Yeah, look, I, I just, I, it is a public appeal because what I want to tell the SBA, and I'm not going to reveal it publicly, there, it's likely that another major Nashville venue is going to close. Douglas Corner Cafe, part of my heart still throbbing on that stage over there, and I had to close because of this. And here's what's frustrating. Some of these venues could apply for paycheck protection, but they're waiting for what they think would be a bigger amount for shuttered venues. And now two months into it, while y'all aren't getting these applications out, venues are closing. Tell them I said it. Get <laughs> this. Get, no, but seriously, get this thing going. There's no reason not at least to give us the basics so we'll know how to navigate our choices yeah. and, 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 and have a promise. You know, most music venues in the United States or leased, people pay rent. Mm -hmm. At least if you can tell your landlord it's coming, that might buy some of these classic venues some time. Yeah. So anything else you wanna add? You're up to a couple other things too, legislatively. Um, I'm, 
I'm up to less than I than I'd hoped to be. Uh, there was there was some thought at the end of last year that there might be a pretty significant overhaul of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that has slowed significantly with the new Congress. Um, I, we may still see some changes in that where hopefully make it easier for you to take down pirated material from places like YouTube, not play this whack-a-mole scenario yeah. where and you- don't get it, but piracy is still a damn big problem across oh this planet. It's still a huge problem. I, I'm not, not so not sure topic, that, yeah, I'm not, if we, who knows, it's massive. It is. Um, <laughs> So join the Nashville Songwriters Association if you can to support what we do. This is what we do. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. We've got an obscure tax issue we're working on a lot. You know, we're waiting to see who the new administration appoints, especially to the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, because there's been some crazy stuff going on with, um, with uh, that. Bill, I love this question. Bill Foster, <laughs> what about my reel to reel deck? 1973, if, if you ever saw the movie Almost Famous, I had a, ver I lived a version of that. Uh, I went to work for a local, two local radio stations in the same building when I was 16 years old in high school. And we were an NBC affiliate and they started this big national show to compete with the King Biscuit Flower Hour. And you'll probably remember that. And, uh, and it was called Words and Music. And I went out on the road with rock bands as a kid and did the interviews, made a lot of money on it and blah, 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 blah. And I saved all that. I also became a news director later, which sort of led to my path from working for governor, for Congress to NSAI. And Bill, I carried a bunch of reel tapes and I have literally down here on the floor have a trash bag, one of the big boys half full of cassette tapes that I'm transcribing. Over here, there's two VHS recorders finding priceless stuff on this, and that's what they're for. Here's the real answer to that. I went somewhere to get somebody to transcribe one of these VHS tapes, and I wanted 200 bucks. I said, hell, I'll figure it out myself. <laughs> it's priceless stuff, and some of it none of you will ever hear or see, because it's in a lot box, but that's what the story is behind it. Anything you want to add, Jennifer? No, I'm good to okay. throw it back over to Jeff. Well, before we throw it back to Jeff, why don't we make, and look, we're struggling for budget to balance our own budget, but Jeff, I'd like to make on behalf of NSAI, because Jennifer and I both love the IBMA. We've got a rich history with it. Let's make a $500 donation today to this leadership program. So you just oh, tell Jennifer so where much. to send that, and maybe when we're live, that'll pay for the croissants next year. Okay? <laughs> we're both in a program that I think you patterned this after. I know Cheryl Blackman was, Leadership Music in Nashville. When he told me y'all were doing this, I'm like, yes, call on us. And, and we couldn't support this kind of program more. It's important. Well, thanks so much for, for setting that example. And, and we do appreciate your donation. Well, hold on a minute. Let's see if somebody else will, will match mean, it on $100 suggest... before we get off here. Somebody in this chat room, give us 100 I was going Look to suggest being... that exactly. <laughs> Look at me being the whatever. Come on. We've set a great seriously. example here, folks. We got uh, seven or eight of you out there. Uh, why don't you open up your wallets and, uh, you know, we sure could use the donations. Cause... Well, it's going to pay huge benefits because, you know, bluegrass, th there's just so many things that this leadership program can do to not only promote the genre, but to help the members commerce it. And we're dedicated to that too. So let us know. Thank you so much. And, 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 and Bart and Jennifer, just my, my heart goes out. By the to way, you. you see why I invited Jennifer, right? Of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm reading questions off the paper. So I got you. Well, you're both, you're both heroes. You're both heroes to the industry and to the songwriters out there. Um, you know, us consumers and producers and Can I get one more look at that long neck B18. <laughs> oh, sure. You're welcome. One more look at that. Stop by and man, play it sometime. So jealous. <laughs> well, I can't play, but I'm listening to you play. Anyway, you're 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 really heroes to all of us in the in the industry. And uh, I can't imagine the complexity of your job dealing with the, the federal government and the congressional committees on on this kind of thing. Uh, it just uh, it's really awesome uh, what, you, what you've done. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'd also like to thank Ron Raxter of the Leadership Bluegrass Committee for putting this session together. Uh, Leadership Bluegrass Online will continue next week 
with a discussion on the business of online education, followed by a performance from a, Ju uh, a German group this time. And it is uh, Johnny and the UA Who's. I think I pronounced that correctly. And uh, we would love to see you all back and tell well, your friends about props this. out to my favorite bluegrass band, the Carmonas. Check them out. They rock. They're amazing. I'll do that. That's great. Yeah, they're the Carmonas. That's C A R M O N A S. We'll take a look at that. And uh, if you'd like to hear more about the about some of the legal aspects and the licensing aspects, we do cover it in depth in the in the Leadership Bluegrass uh, sessions. And if you're a little confused about mechanical royalties versus performance royalties, circle P, circle you know C, uh, these kinds of things are covered in in and you get to answer questions and you, you really do learn quite a bit about it. Uh, not to mentioning the, the networking uh, that takes place in the in the class is 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 equally important. So if you're out there and you're thinking about uh, applying to leadership bluegrass, I sure uh, I sure encourage all of you to to do so.